Thank you. Okay, before we open this, we'll um, read the remote script. This open meeting of uh, the select board is being conducted remotely pursuant to chapter 20 of Acts of 2021. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless, unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. We'll be doing that after the presentation, after the select board has started kind of some of the conversation, but we will, I will bring in the public uh, in this workshop, but closer to the end. Uh, let's see. Uh, so members, when I call your name, please respond in, in the affirmative. Melissa Murphy. Here. Christy Parentella. Oh, she's just connecting the audio. All right, we'll do staff right now. Uh, Libby Gibson. Here. Graham Dervich. Here. Janet Schulte. Here. Uh, Rick Sears. Here. Okay. And for uh, consultants, we have George Aronson here. Hi, George. Hello, here. Uh, Christy Parentella. Here. And Matt Fee, can you hear me? Here. All right. So that's a little roll call. Using Zoom webinar for meetings, which allows for the, the public to participate in the meeting as an attendee. Today, I think it looks like everybody's just coming in on as participant. People registered to be an attendee must use their names, otherwise, not be allowed to participate in the discussion. Uh, chair will call on those who raise their hands. I think I'll, I'll just remind people the, the public, when, once we get to the when the public can speak, just to do the uh, digital raise handing, that, that'll be the easiest way to do it if a bunch of people come on. If it's just us, if it's just, you know, you, Chris, and if you want other, then we can all just kind of have a conversation and raise our hand like that. Okay. Um, I don't think there's be any votes taken, so uh, let me be doing that. All right, I'll open up the select board. Uh, meeting of November 15th. Uh, we'll call it to order. Let's see if I can find that agenda. So long-term solid waste planning workshop. Here we go. Um, Libby, do you want to open it up and sure. get started? Yes, thank you. So the board hopefully will recall that at your Meeting on October 13th, when we gave a pretty comprehensive review of where we are with the strategic plan, we mentioned that we wanted to get a workshop scheduled with you to review some specific long term solid waste planning issues that deserve um, some pretty detailed um, review and discussion. Not all of which needs to happen tonight. Our, our thinking is to schedule a series of these, perhaps quarterly, over the next couple of years as we move toward the conclusion of the waste options contract in 2025. We have some big decisions to make ultimately with long-term impacts. There are, there are going to be significant costs to some of this. There are some complicated paths with, with a variety of interactions. We've been meeting quite a bit lately internal staff to determine what those decisions are and if we do this, what happens? And if we do this, what happens? And George has prepared a pretty interesting flow chart, which can get quite, not convoluted exactly, but <laughs> complicated. Um, so we're not, we've, we've, I think, made it a little uh, less complicated for your workshop today. We do need some confirmation and or guidance on some key points. And if we can get some of that today, that would be great. Otherwise, I think we are, um, <laughs> sorry. I just think it's funny when somebody's dog is barking. Um, okay, now I lost my train of thought. Um, Okay, the big things that we need you to do, yes. Those, some of those can happen today if you feel comfortable with it. Other, otherwise, I think we would like to have you think about them over the next couple of months and take them up at a, at a workshop meeting. And George and Graham, you can remind me, I think we talked about that in some time in February maybe or early March, so, somewhere around there. February 7th. Thank you, um, earlier February, thank you very much. So I, uh, we've developed a PowerPoint and I think George is gonna start us out with it. We do have about six key questions. And again, I think we wanna take you through the questions, review them, and then bring you back to the questions to 
to answer any questions or comments or input you all might have. So um, George, I would turn it over to you at this point and then Graham has got some items as well. Sorry, this is Erica, can I just interrupt? Is George gonna share his PowerPoint or do you want me to? Uh, Eric, it's probably- do. Yeah, if it's easiest for you to do it, why don't you go ahead and do it? I also presume that as we as there's discussion, you can turn it off and on so that people can see each other during the discussion. So it's not just looking at slides, which sometimes inhibits discussion because the discussion is important. So we'll keep the slides to the slides. And that way, you know, if we want to go back and show somebody or somebody wants to see a detail, they're available, but they're not necessarily dominating the screen. So we can focus on people. Sounds good. And with that, let's share and get started. I know, Graham, did you want to just jump in at the start or do you want, or I'm happy to take it either way. Sure, I can just, uh, I can cover it when, um, for the first slide or two when Erica shares it. Great, we can cool. jump to the next one, please. Thank you. So as, uh, as Libby mentioned, we have a few key questions that we are looking for your guidance on. Um, you see the six ahead of you here. Um, we'll spend about 15 to 20 minutes on each. Um, delving into them after a brief presentation from George or I. And um, as George said, we'll under, uh, unshare the screen so we can just have a little bit of a conversation. Um, and there's obviously way more than we could ever discuss in 20 minutes, but in order to cover each one of these and give each time, we'll have to move on at a certain point. And then uh, we will just wrap up at the end. Thanks. Okay, so I think what we th talked about was just a, a brief overview of solid waste to keep these uh, ideas fresh in your mind and also for the members of the public who are looking in just so we have some common vocabulary and images to go forward. I don't want to spend too much time, but I do think it's important just to refresh and review everything. So here's an aerial of the facilities at the 188 Madiket Road site. Uh, the town owns the site. And uh, if you look at the facilities, uh, you can see the composter right in the middle. It's actually a complex of uh, three different structures. The top is where the waste uh, goes in. You see the sort of the horizontal line, which is the drum, which turns it for composting and then moves into the bigger building, which is labeled composter facility where residuals are separated from organics imperfectly. Uh, the organics go on, they're aerated, they're moved outside and eventually windrowed and turned into compost. The residuals go to the landfill. And the whole thing is, uh, is ventilated and the air is clean using the biofilter to the left. So it's a space where things that, uh, where operations involving odor generation can be controlled without the odors being released to the outside. And there's been a pretty good record of that. Uh, the uh, uh, and just to be clear, right now, today, as we speak, this compost is not being marketed. It's being stockpiled. It's being stockpiled uh, for a couple of reasons. In the past, there had been uh, biosolids from the Surfside Wastewater Treatment Plant mixed, mixed with the compost. When the compost was treated, PFAS were found. And at that point, it was decided to wait and wait for decisions of the Mass DEP uh, as to how to handle the PFAS, what standards there might be, et cetera. Uh, that weeding period has been about a year now, and it's not clear where that's going to go. And so part of this is a decision uh, in the face of a significant uncertainty regarding the composter. I'll get back to that. I just wanted to put that out there because it's an important part of the discussion. Uh, to the right, you see the materials recovery facility. Again, some of the materials dropped off through self delivery, some is delivered to that facility by haulers, it's sorted. Uh, everything that can be recycled is basically recycled on the mainland. Some materials get sorted, bailed, and sent off uh, right now to mainland facilities. Uh, at a cost, at this point, there is some money that comes back from revenue. The markets aren't as bad as they were a year ago which is good. Bigger picture, if you look at MRFs around the country and around the state, they tend to be 10 to 20 to 50 times the size of Nantucket's MRFs. So their costs are lower than the town's costs per ton. 
There are real economies of scale Nantucket just doesn't have. Uh, so there's a limit what you can do on the space and for the cost. But right now, the material's moving, uh, but it does raise cost questions. And that's you know an issue for Nantucket like many others. Uh, if you look to the left, you see a bunch of numbers in red and then a square facility with a 12 on it. The square facility is the transfer station where construction and demolition debris comes in, and that is all shipped off to the mainland. And right now that's being sent by train to Youngstown, Ohio. That's a very expensive proposition. Uh, we'll get back to that. Uh, the numbers in the boxes a little hard to read are various stockpiles of what i'll call hard to manage waste the household trash is the easy stuff this is mattresses tires freezers with freon coils all sorts of things electronic waste uh things that require special attention that also get shipped to the mainland at a cost uh, that's a service that has to be continued and provided to the island if you look above it no, sort of above the 12 you see kind of an unpaved area with piles of what looks like dirt on it that's where the real composting tends to happen and those piles move around uh, right now the town gets an enormous amount of leaf and yard waste and that is being composted and that is being moved and in fact a very high quality product is being produced from the leaf and yard waste uh, so that is going on now, but it is an unpaved pad and it is some space. We'll talk about that a little more going forward. And again, if you look in the top left, you see a pile that says old compost. Now from 2001 to 2019 or 2000, early in 2020, the town was making compost out of a combination of the biosolids from the Surfside or wastewater treatment plant and the MSW that was coming in. When that combination uh, of materials was making compost that couldn't be sold or marketed, it was stockpiled. And that's a pretty big stockpile sitting there. Uh, that's something that has to be considered as well. One of the concerns is that because it had biosolids in it, it may have PFAS in it. And in fact, uh, it may be a contributor to PFAS on the whole Madiket site, that's being assessed, that's an effort that's going forward, but it raises another potentially uh, important cost question. So any questions about what's what and what's where to this point? Uh, but I just wanted to do that and make sure people are here at least about current status. So next slide, please, Erica. Thanks. This is taken a few steps back. You can see on the right, the yellow area is the is what was blown up in the prior slide. A little better view of the stockpiles, and you can see the compost windrows in the bottom right are in a different configuration because the slide was taken at a different time. That dirt gets moved around on that pad a lot. But this shows the whole site, including the DPW facility, including the landfill and including the neighbor to the facility, which is very important, which is Long Pond. And uh, again, uh, if you look at the area labeled landfill phases 1, A, B, and C, that's the area that's inactive. Uh, the town is under a administrative consent order to close that within a certain amount of time frame of June 30th, 2019. Those deadlines have obviously not been met, but the DP knows all about it. And in fact, uh, one of the things the town is doing now is formalizing with the DEP their recognition of the delay. And the reason for the delay is in large part because there are questions of how the PFAS affects the closure. And DP understands the delay. They're on board with it, at least the the people in Southeast region who, have dealt, who are responsible for overseeing the ACO, but we're trying to get that under control. So that's the area when we talk about closing the landfill, we're talking about ABC. It's kind of a triangle with a piece cut out of it. This is an active cell over here uh, below the DPW. You can see it's kind of a light yellowish. Uh, yeah, exactly, thank you. 
area. That's the active area where the residuals of the compost are, are going. Uh, and uh, that was carved out from the landfill mining program that was conducted from 2009 to 2019. Just for review for those who uh, may not have been on the board during that whole 10 year period, uh, there was about 100,000 uh, cubic yards mined per year over a 10 year period. So that's about a million cubic yards. It wasn't the whole landfill. The whole mound is about 4 million cubic yards or maybe 4 million tons, just to put a uh, sense on it. So close to a quarter was moved of that. About 30% uh, is residual material that will need to go back into the area that's closed. About 70% is soils that the town hoped would be reclaimed. But again, there's the question of whether they're contributing to PFAS on the site or not that's being investigated on an ongoing basis. So the whole closure is being held up until that question is resolved. Uh, so we've talked about 1ABC, 2ABC. I think the other point to make here is that there's a general concern that stormwater moves from right to left and groundwater moves from right to left. What's the impact on uh, Long Pond? There are concerns raised about nitrogen, certainly PFAS, other things. What is attributable to the landfill itself? What to other factors? That's an open issue. And frankly, an another question is going to be, you know, what measures should the town be pursuing uh, to address that particular situation going forward? I think that's clearly, you know, I, that's been raised uh, by a number at a number of past meetings and, it, and on any list of questions, it ought to be one of the prominent questions. So I'm going to stop there for questions on the site. And hopefully, you know, that didn't take too long away from discussion, but we have some common understanding of the site, uh, some of the details, some of the facilities, some of the issues before the select board, and we'll be getting back to these and hopefully covering at least some of them at a high level as we go forward. So with that. Thanks, George. And I'm going to just add to what you just said with the active cell, so our current active cell, what George pointed out, um, and Erica helped with with the mouse. Uh, we have an expected life of about 10 years or a little less at this point. So bearing that in mind as well is, is important. And the only thing as a reminder that goes into the landfill um, it, it are those residuals is contaminants in the re, uh, compostable waste. Um, okay. Yeah. So at this point, I think we're going to go back to the the questions and start. Okay, Graham, you're going to pick up the next two slides. So I'll turn it back to Graham. Thanks, George. So yes, as mentioned, uh, we, we provided you an update um, to your solid waste environmental leadership goal a couple weeks ago, as Libby mentioned, um, and now we're seeking your guidance really um, in this critical decision-making moment for the future of solid waste, um, both reduction and management here on Nantucket. So we'll jump to the next slide, please. Um, so now that we've had the overview that George went over, here's another look at those questions we saw earlier. As we work through the first four, um, we're moving from what is typically viewed as you know, the most effective and sustainable ways of managing waste to um, least desirable ways of managing waste. So let's get started with waste reduction. And I'm gonna just note the time. Okay, we can jump to the next slide, please, Erica. So as we consider the local role of waste reduction for the future um, here in Nantucket, it's also important to note that the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, has set a 90% waste reduction goal by 2050. While some in the solid waste world, you know, may be questioning how attainable this is, um, the aggressiveness of DEP's goal um, is noteworthy and certainly speaks uh, to the rapidly diminishing waste capacity in the Northeast. Um, as George mentioned, you know, our waste, our CND waste construction and demolition is going to Ohio. Um, and that's not uncommon for the Northeast um, when it gets shipped. So certainly Nantucket has been seen as a role model statewide for our waste reduction and management practices. 
thanks to many Nantucketers over the decades. Uh, so how do we align ourselves going forward um, with the state's goal? Should the town set its own goal? Uh, do we follow the state's master plan, zero waste strategy, or do we develop our own? Waste reduction programs, um, the opportunities for them really abound, uh, both for decreasing quantities of waste and toxicity, um, or sorry, for quantities of waste and also the toxicity of waste, right? Um, so examples include reusable takeout containers, take it or leave it improvements, deconstruction and salvage, food rescue, um, and so forth. Obviously, PR, marketing, and rebranding uh, can be really useful tools towards affecting behavior change. And then there's also those a lot of data proven incentives and regulations, including pay as you throw programs, tip fees for disposal, uh, and local waste and contamination, contaminant waste bans. Our plastic ban is a great example of that. You know, um, do we ban PFAS on Nantucket somehow? I don't know. You know, th th these are the questions we need to be working on. Um, pay as you throw systems are DEP's number one recommendation for communities. They've seen it most effective, reducing 29% of household waste. Um, and we've actually seen pay as you use systems similar to pay as you throw, right? Um, that have been really effective locally here on Nantucket. Prior to 1961, Wana Comet charged a flat rate for water, you know, based on the number of outlets, the type of outlets. Um, it's similar to our kind of antiquated landfill user fees that we currently have for businesses. Um, in eight years um, after 1961, when they put in a water metering system, um, Nantucketers use an average 58% less water. That's pretty considerable. And it's good to see it happening on our, our local, um, local island, right? Because Nantucket can be somewhat different from the mainland, um, but it was really effective with water. Um, and then lastly here, um, the subject area in the subject area of waste reduction today, uh, we're looking at what can we do with removing items of toxicity from waste streams, right? So toxicity can be thought of as a spectrum, you know, with hazardous waste on one end and then say, you know, pure Nantucket aquifer drinking water at the other being non-toxic, you know, so we have toxic and then non-toxic and then everything else falls in between somewhere. So generally we want to avoid adding something more toxic to something less toxic. Um, and, you know, relatedly, we also want to keep items as source separated as possible. Uh, PFAS, as George mentioned, as an emerging contaminant um, is a perfect case in point. Um, who knows what the next PFAS will be, what the next emerging contaminant of concern will be. Um, so waste, seg waste segregation um, is key to minimizing um, the introduction of unknown um, and emerging contaminants into a different waste stream. And as George mentioned, as an example, biosolids from the wastewater treatment plant are no longer go through the composter, getting added to you know, the food waste and less, less toxic, shall we say, um, materials, um, and they're being landfilled instead. So I guess to start it off, we can jump out of the presentation, Erica, please. Um, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on should the town develop our own roadmap um, with metrics, measurements, milestones, goals? Um, do we follow the states? How, where do we fit in with you know, the state's goals? Any thoughts, Chrissy? I think starting with the state goals, and then kind of seeing where we want, like we at least want to be in line with the state, but I always see Nantucket as kind of being a leader in different areas. So I would say, you know, what are what are the goals that we could go even further than what the state is requiring? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of work backwards on this. I, I look at it and say, what are our options? What are our costs? What can we realistically do? And then we, you know, I, I don't think that we, A, I think I don't think the five of us have the knowledge and the ability to, you know, so to answer some of this, I think, you know, we've, we've probably read the request for proposals and the various options. I'd like to hear from George and, and see what sort of 
what the costs are, what the, you know, what options we have, and then work our way backwards to this. I think this is kind of, it's important. And I think race reduction is important. I do know from, you know, I, I do know that when we charge for things, they end up on the moors. So, you know, that's the one big difference between here maybe and the rest of the world. So, you know, that, that has been, a, that's been my experience. Graham? If I can just speak to the, you know, the illegal dumping, I've, I've asked numerous communities and people at the state level and, you know, other communities that are similar to Nantucket Islands, you know, outside of Massachusetts within about illegal dumping and pay as you throw. And I've been repeatedly told, because I, I know I hear, hear that, that uh, worry here and certainly me coming from a place of ocean plastics, you know, that's my history, that's my background, that's my foremost concern and why I do what, what I do, what I do. Um, what I've repeatedly heard is that they, communities had illegal dumping beforehand and then they did pay as you throw and they had illegal dumping still, or they did it in the reverse thing and it, it doesn't make a difference. Those two things are not correlated despite what we often think here in Nantucket. And certainly I know back, I think it was in 2004, the select board um, took away the, the disposal fees for the tip fees for bulky items, the hard to manage waste items. And we do the litter derby every year and we're still finding that stuff out there um, and new stuff, right? So it really comes down to kind of some enforcement in that area. Um, but I, I, I wonder if, you know, perhaps they are separate. Are we missing out on some great gains um, in waste reduction through a pay as you throw or tip fee or however we structure it? Um, and if illegal dumping is just gonna continue no matter what, you know, we might as well take advantage of what we can. Just to throw out there what I've heard. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, George, you want to and get I, in there too, I think. Yeah, no, and I and I appreciate that, Graham. I just I know that when we were charging for, you know, we had more, we may we had more of certain types, you know, we probably have about the same amount of dumping, but you know, it's not someone dumping 15 mattresses and leaving. You know, like you know, look, I'm going back 20 years. May, you know, maybe we can enforce, but I don't know who's gonna do that. I don't, you know, so I, I just think. I'm all for charging people and, and, and changing behavior, but I think we also have to be aware that we have half the island is open space and plenty of places to go and drop it, so. Okay, all right. okay. let me jump in here and try to answer uh, Matt's question. I mean, there are a couple of ways to do this, and one of them is actually, in fact, to, you know, I think Nantucket has data on its waste stream, so we do know what it is that needs to be reduced. And then it's a fair bit of work to go component by component, making sure everything has a place to go, figuring out what of that could reasonably be reduced and then start setting goals over time. Uh, I will say this, that the, uh, the Mass DEP goal is very controversial. On one hand, there are activists who love it and would say, set the goal high, and if, even if you fall a little short, you've done a lot. Uh, I think you'll see industry people who are saying, this is unrealistic, and we have to clean up the mess when the goal isn't met. And if there's, no, if the, if there's nothing in Massachusetts, and now we're sending to Ohio and South Carolina, and when South Carolina closes, we have to go to Alabama, and this is getting ridiculous, we need something locally that addresses this. Uh, I think that there are a couple of principles that are helpful. One is that if there's something that you can process locally, make it possible to do that. If there's an incentive that you can have locally for reduction, put it in place. And I think maybe what I'm hearing is some direction from Matt and others that, you know, let's start accumulating some program suggestions and some numbers based on composition and maybe spend some time at the staff level putting a plan together to see what it would mean to make the goal or get halfway there or a third of the way there and you know learn through maybe experience in 2021 how much issue there is there's going to have to be some sort of enforcement as part of it i think we've learned that uh maybe it'll work out and you know we would need guidance as to what's okay for enforcement but and, and, and again, you can't just tell, tell people there's nothing you can do. You have to give them an alternative and information. So there's public outreach 
as well as part of all of this. Uh, but it, and it, on the other hand, there is an argument that by setting a goal and maybe an interim goal, you're, you're setting something that people can talk about and think about and say, aha, we have this problem, we can contribute to its solution, and here are some ways we can do that, just changing the culture and conversation on the island. Uh, and how you do that with a seasonal and a temporary population is a big challenge that we all recognize. But you know, on the other hand, you're never going to do it if you don't get started. So the question is, how much effort? How is this a priority? Where does this fit? Uh, what are people thinking? And again, you know, we're looking for guidance because you know specific ideas come up to us. If, for example, charging a tip fee is just a no-no and the board select board doesn't want to pick that fight and wants to defer that, that's one piece of guidance. On the other hand, if it's time to look into that and go through a process and see if we can do it, then that's that would be helpful to know. And we shouldn't be making that decision. We need that guidance from you. Similarly, a bag program or a container program, you know, we'll talk about colored bags in a little bit, but some towns you pay a buck or two bucks a bag and you can fill the bag and you get five bags free and everything after that you pay for and so the people who make more pay more uh and there are towns that have done that very successfully and seen results uh then you generate more plastics from the bag so there's a trade-off uh maybe you can do it with the containers but again i think we're looking in the direction of how much should we do what's the best way to approach this and hopefully, you know, I've thrown out some things where you can give us some guidance and thought. George, I, I just to throw some of my, my thoughts in here. I think we're going to get in trouble if we start recommending, if we get into the specifics first. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we, let, let's do color bags and this. If it's not connected to major goals. And maybe it's not, Graham, you said state goals or our goals. I, I really don't know. I mean, state goal seems pretty pretty wild, but I don't also don't mind shooting for the stars. But I think if we have goals and reduction, and um, you know the the tech piece, our, our bigger goals, then you guys can say, okay, well here's how here's the only way you can do that. You know, here, here, and here. And this one is politically not great. It's gonna be really hard to change human behavior because change is not. Uh, easy here. Um, I, I think if if we could find something where 80, we could change 80, 70, 80% of human behavior, that would be a major difference. You know, if 12 people go out a week and dump, it looks like it's hundreds of people, right? Because one picture is, is the worst, right? It goes out on social media, but it might not be the end of the world, right? If you look at the upside, I'll just use this, that 80% number. So, if, uh, if really can change behavior. I think the majority of people will change because they want to take care of the, the island. The bad players just, whether they can or can't, you know, play ball, it really sticks out. So I'm, I'm okay with some of the downside, some of the visuals, the downside in the beginning. But I think we got to go back to, you know, reduction has to be one of our three or four major goals. But I don't, I don't know if I feel confident enough to say this or that. Yeah, and, all, and in all fairness, um, you know, we're presenting this all to you. So this was just the first thing and we're going to get into a lot more. So, you know, okay. we hope to circle back with you all later once, you know, we've gone over a little more of this. Um, you don't have to have all the answers right now. So but thank you for the feedback. Yeah, I mean, what I'm also hearing is that maybe we have to think about tying programs to goals in some sort of way that people can understand, which we have. obviously it's a little early to do. So maybe we have some staff work to do now before, you know, we can come back to with you with a little more flesh on these bones and uh, say, you know, you're all right, 90% by 2050, that's 30 years, that's a long, long way. Let's figure out a way to measure progress and see if we can get, you know, X percent by 2030 or 2040, maybe throw some interim things in there, maybe have a list of options to try and see where they go, or even a program of how to get there. Uh, but I mean, it's going to be a lot of work, it's going to be some effort. So it's important to understand if this is a priority, and I'm hearing that it is. And so, and, and the other part of this, I'll just say is that sometimes forcing us to present it to you helps us think through it more as well. 
And so this is very helpful in terms of articulating our own uh, thoughts on where this might go. Just, I just want to throw one thing out there. We, we have a lot, think about our, our, the big, big policy decisions in front of us. This is one that we have the most control over. If you compare it to mm -hmm. coastal resiliency or housing, uh, I don't know, I, I think I, I could probably be convinced the, uh, the opposite. How do you control the behavior of 20, 30, 50,000 people when it comes to trash? Because it happens every day. But I feel like we can control it. Like we could put different tech in. We could versus Mother Nature, coastal resiliency. And, you know, um, but we have we kind of have the tools in front of us. So I think that's a positive. Implementing will be hard, but. So we could get a little more guidance if you have it right now. So I I feel as if I'm hearing that pay as you throw might be, you know, a program like that tip fees might be off the table. And maybe if you can speak a little bit more to that, if you have an idea right now, or you, you need some more information on that. Um, and then I'm also going to ask about regulations, um, like deconstruction and salvage, for instance, if we wanted to have a regulation like that or beyond for the construction demolition debris, or we wanted to do more like voluntary programs like textile recycling, where are you seeing across the board or where are you seeing yourselves going in the future? I want to go to Melissa here, but I'm not sure everybody has said that we're not into, we want, we're against pay as you go or pay as you throw. I don't think I've heard that from everybody, but maybe everybody can chime in. Melissa? Thanks. Um, and Graham, I'm going to sort of punt on your question too for a second. Um, certainly, I'm not against the idea. I think the, the concept or the feedback I'm hearing for pay as you go is that um, we want to make sure it's tied to these goals and is feasible. And one thing I think I have a, a great deal of concern about and um, is how people are bringing their waste to the facility. And there is a great number of people, particularly seasonally, who are using hauling services to do that. And so where does that fit into this, to some of these recommendations? Um, for example, colored bags. Um, if I'm paying a hauler to pick up my bags, I'm still gonna be responsible for picking up those bags and they would sort them for me um, at when they get to the facility. I, I, I have a lot of concern about making changes without considering how I think at last I heard it was 70 to 85% of the waste is picked up by haulers. Um, not everyone goes and takes it to them, themselves to the dump. So where is that figuring in, in in some of these recommendations that you have? Right. So we're going to, you're jumping the gun, you know, what's already <laughs> had. Um, did you get a sneak peek? Uh, so George is going to talk about that in a bit. Um, about that and pay as you throw, oh, sorry, colored bags um, actually is a, in a way an answer to those challenges that the haulers have expressed. Um, and I'll let George talk about that um, when we get there if you're- Okay. Really and then yep. I, and my only other comment, I guess, is in the separation between residential and commercial waste as far as pay as you go goes um, and, and how that factors into some of these decisions. and. From a policy perspective, do we need to be really differentiating the commercial waste from residential waste in terms of these efficiencies or updates? Um, I know that. Uh, well, anyway, that that's some of the feedback and thoughts that that I have when I hear "pay as you go." So I can tell you a little bit about what's currently happening. So not everything is free for drop off um, at the you know if you come to the landfill if it goes over the scale um, and your commercial for the most part, you have to pay. Pallets are an exception, and there's a couple other exceptions. Um, if you're a resident, um, pretty much everything's free. You know, if you have C and D, like a large amount of C and D, a construction demolition degree, it's gonna be charged as commercial, commercial type project. Um, but, you know, appliances, um, tires, mattresses, all that is free for residents currently. So that's where it currently stands. Um, but that's certainly something to, to look at in the future um, as well. If you if you all want to increase any of the fees or add fees at all. Yeah. Melissa? I, yeah, thank you. And I guess that would be a big um, consideration, you know, how much, I mean, again, I think, you know, when we talk about commercial, there's so many nuances, right? A, a restaurant is disposing of waste differently than a landscaping company or a construction company. Um, so, you know, I, I, 
I don't, I don't know how we're sort of breaking that down. I, I'm not sure confident that a lot of restaurants are paying people to pick up their waste um, as opposed to me and my property management company. I've got people taking stuff through the scale multiple times a day. Um, so those kinds of nuances for the pay as you go, I think are going to be really important considerations for us from a policy perspective, because there's different demographics that is going to hit in different ways. And to address some of what Matt was saying, when we sort of boil that down to some residential risk, it may be a lot less than we're considering, as you said, Graham, in the larger picture of what we might be talking about paying for and, and who's paying for it. Sure. Who's got the, right. Um, and if I can just respond to that. One thing that pe some people are not aware of, or I would say many people are not aware of, you may be, um, is that when a business pays or even, you know, an individual pays for a hauler to pick up their waste, the hauler drops it off at the facility for free if it's just regular household waste, um, which is unheard of, quite frankly, off island. Um, it's, you know, been what's happening here. And, you know, certainly the haulers are keeping a lot of traffic off the roads coming out to Madigan. You can imagine what the lines would be if we didn't have the haulers. Um, but that is something to keep in mind as well. And I'll just say that uh, that the question of whether there should be a fee is separable from the question of how or where should the fee be set so that's fair and effect. And so they both have their own nuances and details, and mm -hmm. we shouldn't ignore either one, which is what I'm hearing from you, that it's not only is there a fee or not, it's how do we set the fee so it's fair, not disruptive, and provides the outcome we want and doesn't hit any specific group uh, in a particularly discriminatory or, or painful way, in a way that we don't anticipate. So that's that's its own piece of work in art. Yeah. And we'll we'll take uh, we're we'll taking notes as we go and, and remember awesome. that. And appreciate that. Awesome. George, I think if we can move forward, we're we're at four forty-two already. Okay, we're doing okay. Uh, so let's go with the next slide. Uh, Erica. Okay, uh, and it looks like there's a lot on the page, page, but there's a underneath the complication. There's a fundamental question, which is today as we speak, waste is going into the composter. It's being composted, and the compost is being stockpiled. And if that was going to happen forever, well, that's not the best outcome. And so the question, again, staying very high level, uh, not to you know make it too easy, but trying to make it so that we can articulate the questions and the issues, uh, is commitment, you know, right now the composter is under contract to be the item of use through November 2025. Should the default or preferred way of doing this going forward be to find a way to use the composter and or and right now that's been staff's presumption. The presumption being that the composter has what I'll call three uh, issues or stools or problems that it must overcome. The first is PFAS content in the composter. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The second is uh, other contamination in the composter unrelated to PFAS, but things that come in with the waste and haven't gotten screened out as well as they might have be it glass or what have you. And then the third is this, I'll use the word branding or the perception of the compost that it isn't a good product. It passed as a legacy of difficulties with the compost product in past years. And I think if the composter is gonna be successful going forward, it's gotta meet all three challenges. It's gotta be something you can distribute without fear of, com of PFAS content. It's got to be a high enough quality so that people actually want to take it and use it. And I think even if it's at high quality, people still have to have the perception that it is high quality and have that different perception uh, than it is now. We'll hear a lot of people disparage the uh, quality of the compost uh, on the basis of the past. So I think that's sort of the 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 feeling now at this point uh at, at the staff level 
And uh, this is ongoing, of course, but our feeling is that the challenges can be met. When the biosolids got taken out of the compost feed, we saw a drop in the PFAS coming out. It did make a difference. And the feeling is that if we can divert paper and some of the other products that we know have PFAS in them that are going in, uh, we ought to be get to the point where PFAS in the compost is not an issue and it's a material that can be distributed uh, fairly and in accordance with whatever standards may be applicable from the mass DEP. It is an issue that those standards aren't out there yet, that the mass DEP has not said that if, camp, if compost meets this standard, then it's free to distribute. That hasn't happened as of this point. So there's uncertainty. That piece is somewhat outside the control of the town. Uh, on the other hand, on the quality side, what we have seen is that with additional screening and additional attention to diverting Nurnix and other products, you can make a compost that looks a lot better and probably can meet the quality requirements and in fact be a, a fine product if it's blended with yard waste. Uh, similarly, on the branding, I think once you have a good product with the right effort, you can have that product accepted and it's going to take a little work to overcome the perception out there. But uh, you know, I think if that's recognized, the work can be done. So I think the first question is, and, and in terms of pros and cons, is this the right path to go down or not? Uh, if, as long as there's a feeling that the problems can be solved, the composter's built, it's in place, the debt will be paid off in 2025, and the operations under a new arrangement will be a lot lower than they are under the current waste services agreement. So, so in terms of economics, running an existing facility as opposed to starting from scratch with a new one or shipping it off has a lot of advantages. It's the devil you know, and it's got some devilish challenges to overcome, but it's a whole lot different than either developing a facility from scratch on the island to do this, or frankly, the other alternative, uh, which is to ship it out to the mainland where there's, which has its own crisis. And again, I know Graham mentioned this before, and I don't want to harp on this too much, but you have the DEP saying, well, we're going to reduce uh, waste by 2050 by 90%, but there's no fallback plan. There's nothing that says if we can't export, here's what we're going to do and export has challenges. We're going further and further away from Massachusetts to deliver waste to Ohio, South Carolina, Alabama, Michigan, uh, costing more and more, and the logistics are harder and harder. We're seeing shortages with truck drivers, a real shortage of railroad cars, limitations in space on the two bridges over the Hudson River. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of money out there to spend on infrastructure, but counting on that, I mean, and this is another question for the board. Uh, I mean, the, the staff has been operating on the position that export is an option of last resort rather than something the town should actively pursue just because there are so many risks and potential costs associated with it. If you could get the composter to where it needs to be and the compost to where it needs to be, you're gonna be better off doing something on island than relying on a system off island that's in its own crisis that is completely outside the town's control. But again, looking for feedback, other people have other opinions on that. So again, I think those are the whole question of composting, is it the preferred option, is one of the big questions, or, is, or should we go forward on the basis that the solve it, problems can be solved at this point, even if there's, you know, how should we manage that particular decision? Uh, I think to fill that in, I'll just say very quickly, when we did the RFEI, there are vendors interesting in providing technology for the whole solid waste stream, but none of them have operating facilities in the United States, and it's still an emergency, emerging industry. It may be there at some point. Uh, at this point, it's not quite there yet, and it's something that can be monitored, but I don't know that I certainly would not recommend uh, relying on a new technology facility for all of Nantucket's waste at this point. Uh, 
I know there was a uh, warrant article on uh, combustion incineration uh, for what it's worth. The Mass DP still has a moratorium on permitting of MSW combustion facilities in Massachusetts, which has been in place since 1991. The major vendors have spent umpteen amounts of effort trying to change that, and it hasn't changed, and nobody sees it changing. So as long as that moratorium is in place, the idea of combustion on Nantucket is just not going to happen. There are the other technologies, arguably, are more uh, modern than than combustion. So maybe if you looked a little bit more broadly and interpreted that Warren article in terms of technologies that for treating waste, maybe there's something there to investigate. And I think the staff has investigated that and that's led to the recommendations. So that's a little more background on that. So I think at this point, without getting in a lot of detail, I'd like to open up responses to the composter. Are we doing the right thing by moving forward to try to overcome the challenges with the composter we have and uh, and thinking of uh, shipping off as an issue of last resort rather than as a option and looking the other way. So I'll just ask that question, then we'll come back to some of the other parts of the matrix going forward. Any thoughts, questions? Matt? Again, uh, you're asking us as lay people, lay persons, to answer a question that would be better answered. You know, what is the cost of it? What? How did you compare? I have a feeling for some of this because I've been at it a long time. But you're, you know, it's sort of an unrealistic expectation. Uh, I do have a question though, George. It may help us if we were to comp compost everything that's safe, you know, everything that doesn't have PFAS in it, everything that's compostable but not going to be uh, a danger, how much of the waste stream is left? Okay, I'm going to say what, 30 or 40 percent? Because there, there's a huge organic fraction. Massachusetts has more organics than the mainland, in part because there's more residential commercial activity here and less industry. And we see that in the, in the commercial activity is a lot of restaurants and, 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 and activities that generate uh, commercial waste. Now, not all compostables get composted, but I'm going to throw out 60% uh, that you could that you could be there. Graham, I know you're probably closer to the composition numbers than I am. Uh, you want to take another shot at that? So biannually, we do waste sorts. We take 200 bags of household trash, 100 from the drop-off and 100 from a random hauler who happens to be pulling in when we finish lunch, right? Um, and just make sure it's a residential load. And um, I'm looking at the numbers right now. So I, I would say in terms of what's safe without PFAS, you know, the simplest way, and we'll get into this a little bit more in, a, in the next slide that George will go to, um, would be just food. If we just put food through the composter and that's, you know, paper gets a little bit risky with PFAS. Um, so we're looking at about 40% roughly um, of what's currently going to the composter, 30 to 40% of what's currently going to the composter is, is just food. And in terms of organic, so if you combine food and paper, we're looking at about 50, 60% roughly, um, getting up to 70 sometimes, but um, we've had a lot of contamination recently in our composter, that's why. Right. So, so to follow up, if that's okay, Jason, if yeah. so, so if it was food and untreated paper, because the treated paper is the stuff that's given us problems. If it was food and untreated paper, mm -hmm. you might have 50%, maybe okay. something like that. Yeah. So what happens with the other 50%? Is that all hauled off? So uh, is that buried? Is that hauled off? What's the... We would probably be looking to add that to, we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but we'd be looking to probably simplify it um, to get ourselves in line with the rest of the state in terms of just composting food and just for simplicity's sake for the community as well. If you differentiate between different types of paper, it's just too complicated. Um, so food only would probably be my, our recommendation based on what we've been talking about internally. Um, and then paper, any recyclable paper, we'd be required to recycle it according to the MassDEP waste ban. 
Um, so that'd be a new recycling stream. And that's where the colleague bags also come in um, that George will talk about. And then the rest of it would go into like our non-recycled, non-compostable waste, which is trash, you know, in any composting recycling community off island, right? Hmm. Yeah, uh, okay, let me jump in and add a piece to that, which is one of the questions is, there may not yet be emerging technologies that could handle the entire solid waste, but there, but some of those technologies may be able to handle the Nernix locally. And that's of more interest. In. And, and for example, uh, there's a company out of Concord, Massachusetts that is uh, emerging, developing a gasifier uh, that may be able to take the plastics and some of the paper that's generated if it were source separated in the right way. And is it worth, and we're looking into, they've agreed we're gonna send some, you know, some loads of 500 pound Gaylords of waste to their facility in Concord, assuming they, that it's permanent, just to try it. Uh, maybe observe it, get some data, and ask the question, maybe technology can't solve the whole waste stream mixed up, but maybe we can pick off some of the Nernix, some of the things we can't compost and process them on island. Uh, this particular technology makes electricity. There are others that actually may drop in diesel fuel out of some of the materials. And there's certainly plenty of market for marine diesel fuel on an island, uh, or for that matter, home heating oil. So again, this is emerging technology. It's easier than doing the full mixed waste stream. But if we could take some of these pieces of the stream and take another 20 or 25 percent off and make a product out of it, either a fuel product or electricity, and it doesn't have to go to the mainland, it's at a small enough scale that it makes sense on Massachusetts. And then the other principle that we thought about is we do not want to overbuild. So maybe you can find a modular system where you underbuild and build up, make sure it works, and then only buy what you need uh, instead of overbuilding and committing to a fixed size facility that might not be economic if it were empty, because we don't want to make that mistake of signing up for a fixed amount of waste that in 20 years we won't have. So I think that's, I think, perhaps a, a bit of a riskier take on what do you do with the Nernix, the other stuff that you can't compost. If you can separate it and complement it with another facility on island at the right scale, then maybe you've got a solution that makes you less dependent on the mainland. And then there will always be some amount of material that either will have to go to the landfill or go to the mainland. And if the goal is phrased that let's minimize that over time using whatever techniques we have at our disposal, so to speak, that's kind of the thinking at this point. Uh, to, do, to do that, there has to be, again, we're looking for guidance and I don't, you know, I can't leave this to you at this point without more information as you, as the point is correctly, but you know, I, we're, we're going forward that maybe some trials with this material, sending material off island for processing by existing facilities and getting the information on how they do with Nantucket waste, that that's a, an exercise worth, worth undertaking. And it might in fact be worth, okay. And then the next thing is that if we see people who pass that test, okay, let's get a containerized unit on Nantucket or see what it takes to permit it, site it and do the, and move the product. And if we like the first one, let's put a second one on. And if we like all three of them, and then we our waste reduction works, we can move one of those containers off and be back down to two, and we have sort of the flexibility to manage the stream. Uh, and by, by crawling before we walk, maybe we can actually avoid a big hit on capital cost up front that, we're, uh, that makes us uh, unhappy about it down the road. So that's kind of the thinking we're going on in terms of that. Uh, there will be, I mean, it goes back to the waste reduction. We're gonna start having to pick off streams one at a time and find out and think about how to do them and, and bring people along with us or understand which batch they ought to go into. Uh, and that's gonna be a process that will take some time. Paper is obviously, you know, you're right, I'm right, right. Not all paper is alike and paper napkins are a whole lot different from, you know, uh, plasticized in glossy magazines. Uh, but this is the approach. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but uh, this is the thinking and we're looking for head shakes and, you know, make sure we're going the right direction with this. Follow up. Yeah. 
Yeah, that an that answers my question. That and that's where I was going, George. If you have half and you can pick off another thirty or forty, and then you're dealing with ten percent, and hopefully, you know, and you you're getting somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm glad you asked that question because that's what I was thinking too. So we're in this kind of funny uh, place where, you know, George and Graham are looking for direction and we're kind of saying, well, we need more information. To, to, and so, but I feel like we're, we're progressing well here. So yeah. I agree, Matt. I like if we can, if you're asking like, do we keep the composter? Do we sell it or fix it? And assuming that it'll work forever and it's not, just needs some repairs and yes I, I like the composting and the food and separating like doing it differently and and changing the human behavior maybe we don't have to do the you know pay the you know throw kind of thing maybe we maybe we do but just kind of Matt you, you simply said you know 50 percent go through the composter and pick off another 10 and then 20 and then 30 off, off of the Nernick separating that I think would be would make a lot of sense so adding smaller, like you said, George, better than I could say it, adding smaller pieces of, of technology versus changing the whole system, hoping that the DP lets us do gasification or whatever, whatever it is down the road. We don't have that time. 2025 yeah. in, in this in this situation is pretty much tomorrow. Yeah. I think the other thing, there's kind of a contradiction to say, let's go build a facility to handle you know, all the Nantucket's waste. And the first thing we're going to do is set a goal to make sure it doesn't get what it needs to operate at capacity by reducing it. And so it's another thing to say, well, we already have this device that's running under capacity and we could turn it down even further if we're successful in the other ways. And so it limits, as opposed to a big capital expenditure up front, it's incremental targeted investments towards holes in the in the structure of things that we're not handling. And I thought, so it's just a little bit of, it's more of a portfolio of uh, measures than, you know, looking at one big solution. Melissa or Matt, oh, is there your hands up? I, thanks, Jason. I, 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 yeah, I guess I was gonna say, you know, I'm not a waste management expert at all. So some of the direction I, I in some ways I don't feel totally qualified to give, but um, I think any time that we can use what we have to be um, reduce um, what we're putting into the landfill or shipping off island is a win. So, you know, whatever that, whatever, however that looks is a win for the community. Um, I think that we are as a community and as a species gonna have to start to really think about you know, again, continue to think about how we navigate waste because the planet just can't handle everything that we're producing. So where we can create efficiencies on Nantucket um, is absolutely the direction I think we should be heading in. Um, if that's increasing our ability to compost and I know we spilled the, the beans, but if the colored bags are the solution to that, um, you know, as a, per, I'm a, I'm a very human example. I have a hauler picking up my waste and I'm not confident if I separate between Nernic and compostable that it's actually making a difference. So probably most of my waste is going to Nernic, whereas a community member, I could be doing a better job. So I think when we can make some small changes like that, we're going to see, um, you know, some increased participation and hopefully we're going to have, um, you know, some impact. Um, and then there's those complexities of, um, you know, how, how do we deal with the rest, right? How do we deal with the rest of that? And that's where I'm going to need, you know, for you guys to give us some of your, you know, expert recommendations, because I think that the community would be behind investing in a facility if it made sense and ultimately got us to a, re, a cost saving reduction if we were managing waste better here on the island? Um, or is it that we have to manage it better by shipping it off island? So these are the, you know, there, there's gonna be some cost benefit um, analyses that we're gonna have to do. And I know 2025 is coming up around the corner. On the other hand, you know, is there 
from your perspective, investments we should be making now that maybe are going to be for 2035, <laughs> but have an impact on what we do in 2025. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I, I guess that's where that's where my mind is going when I think about all of this. No, no, actually, that's extremely helpful because I think, you know, for us in the weeds to hear some of the high level concerns expressed is, is you know, that, that's what this process is all about. Number for one. sure. And, you know, and, and, and number two is this is kind of, the, you know, we've been talking about waste a lot, but this is kind of the first workshop we're showing thrown here. My guess is that by the second workshop, it will you'll you'll be able to you know have had more time for this to, th to think about some of these decisions and have more pointed guidance and we understand that so sometimes you just got to start and totally. stumble through at once yeah and put, put our put our feet in the muck so to speak and i guess absolutely. one other quick comment i would love to make is that um, i have not been on the board long enough to be considering all of these things for mm -hmm. such a long time um but i do remember the the great deal of pride Nantucket had when we built our recycling center and the community pride people took in being so highly ranked in terms of our recycling ability. Um, I think many people who live on Nantucket appreciate and understand what a precious resource this is um, and want to do what we can do to protect it. So I'm not as afraid of um, uh, policies that you know get the community to invest in how they're dealing with waste i just think it has to be succinct it has to make sense and it has to be easy to understand and maybe that's mm -hmm. the same thing as succinct but <laughs> i think you see what i'm saying um Absolutely. I, I think i think the community wants to invest in our island resource um and make it as self sustaining as possible and that, that what we can't deal with here there's a really good plan that's economical um to do that with and i'd love to see that sort of renewed pride in how we deal with our waste um some people a lot of people have it i'm not saying it's not there but and i think in the 90s when the recycling program came out there was just like Woo, wow we're so excited like we're so proud yeah. of ourselves right yeah. i want to see that again yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I can follow up, and maybe this is the time to raise this question, which is, uh, and again, this may be something that the board has to consider, which is right now in the waste services agreement, there's an option for the town that the town might exercise to buy the composter at the end of its, uh, at the end of the term of the waste services agreement. Uh, right now, amendment number one says a million dollars. Now, of course, there's ambiguity in the wording of the contract that needs to be negotiated, but uh, I think as a threshold matter, the question is what's the board's attitude to actually buying and owning the composter going forward, as opposed to either continuing to contract for its operation and having it owned by someone else, or doing whatever else needs to be done from a business perspective that doesn't involve town ownership. So the question is, town is an option, is there a sense of we want to own this, we don't want to own it, and again, I'll throw it out there. George, does owning it equal having to operate it? No. Uh, I think one of the things we learned from the RFEI is that there's at least one firm and maybe uh, as many as three that would be interested in, in operating it other than waste options. So that I think, you know, if the town goes forward, and decides to own, there would clearly be a set of business arrangements that would be very different from the existing waste services agreement, which I think for many has proved to be a frustrating piece of paper. Uh, I'll just say that. And so uh, there are a lot of different ways you can go to uh, contract operations. We have been, had done some research on this. Places like Burlington County, New Jersey, and a few in Michigan are actually have contract operators with very different arrangements than the town has with waste options. So I think there are, there's precedent, there's learning, uh, you know, but it's a matter of, you know, the bottom line is the owner has control that it can't have if it doesn't own. On the other hand, it's taking some risks that it doesn't take if it's not the owner. I, I think that I'd have a lot of questions, you know, if, if we could get a new one with new tech, not, not technology that was 5 million or 10 million, and it could do 15% more 
this is, is like if this is what you guys were telling us as a hypothetical, then I would say, oh, then let's get a new one. And because over 15, 20 years, it would do X, Y, Z. But if you're saying like, look, they actually they cost 30 million now, Jason, and this one only costs us a million, costs us $500,000 a year to fix it. Then I would, in the Delta of a, what a new one could do much better than I would say, yeah, we should buy this one and then lease it back to the next operator or, but I, I don't really know all the, Kind of the ins and outs of composters. I haven't checked them on eBay lately. So, <laughs> you might have any other thoughts? What said you? I saw maybe a hand. Yeah, and I you asked the the question. I was going to ask about the operations, and I, you know, one concern that I have, and I'm sure Libby has this too, is that we we've, we've got staffing concerns, and I'm not sure how quickly you know, those are gonna be resolved um, in the next three to five years. So if we're, we're talking about undertaking something that's gonna put, require staff resources, that's a concern to me, where if we have an opportunity to contract it out. I also like what you were saying, Jason, um, what's the, the upside to not, uh, you know, to purchasing new equipment, has technology in the composting arena changed enough, substantially enough that a, a subsequent invest, investment in something new would yield something better and more efficient for Nantucket. So th those were some of my questions too. I think uh, what we learned from the RFER, we only got one responded from one vendor that was interested in installing a totally new system. Uh, and yeah, you're closer to the 30 million than 1 million. Uh, I don't have an exact number obviously, but in terms of order of magnitude, it's a significant number. Uh, do you actually get better performance from a brand new spanking new compost? Well, the same stuff still composts. And if you can make the one you have work, it's not clear that you do get better performance. And in fact, the performance might be the same in either case based on what you prevent from going in the gate at the first place, or maybe you can do get there with add-ons before the drum. That if you if you screen, if you uh, do other things before it, it, you know before you the material goes into the ground, you might be able to do just as well as a composter that would replace it from scratch that probably already has a screening system and you know some other material remov re removal systems. Whether and in fact, we're starting to talk to waste options about some, about some experiments on the question, which is how much can you take out before it gets to the compost or before it gets to the drum? And which I think it go, you know, because if the answer is nothing, you got what you got and a new one would be better, then maybe you look harder at the new one. So that's, I think that's a very helpful uh, instruction for us. And I think we'll spend a little more time trying to flesh that out. Are you Anytime really we're balancing the, you know, technology and looking if there's better technology, we also need to look at the, you know, the soft, you know, technology in a way and human skills, right? Because before we put, you know, 15, 30 million in a new composter, can we put that into changing behavior and regulating what goes into it? And that probably gets us the best type of compost, you know, and just only putting food in, feeding it good stuff to start with, right? So keeping those both in mind. That, 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 that answers a lot, a lot of what I'm thinking is, you know, the, the technology hasn't increased enough. Like, I, I don't even know what it could be, right? Where it just it vaporizes it in two hours and it, <laughs> and it or whatever it may be, it's not there. It's more important to focus on what goes in it or what not, what does not go in it. That's the big X factor, not a new comp compost. It would be nice, right? It wouldn't maybe break down as much, but it, it's not going to produce more over a year significantly enough to get a new composter. Is that, that's kind of what you're saying? Okay. Yeah, I mean, there are there are technologies that are the technology of the, as of the future, kind of like, you know, but the question is, are they technologies of the future that always will be technologies of the future as opposed to be, being technologies that you could use today? And that's the concern we've seen with some of the emerging alternatives. Uh, and again, it's one thing, you know, Doing something to plastic is a whole lot easier than doing something to this mix of a whole bunch of stuff called MSW. If you could pick out one piece of it and treat it, it's easier from a technology point than trying to treat it all and they all need different responses. 
I mean, I think that's a, an intuitive non-technology view of it, but it actually it's it's pretty true. Matt? Here's a question, George. How important is it to have compostable plastics versus uh, plastic plastics? Do you have to separate those? I've heard differing views. Uh, I got to say, and you know, maybe Graham disagrees me, I'm not a fan of compostable plastics. I think that the, what we've seen on, on Nantucket, where you've got basically, you got 72 hours from when it enters the drum, goes on the discharge conveyor and gets through the screen. If it doesn't compost in 72 hours, then you got to pick it out of the pile and that's awful hard. So, uh, and it's not enough time. If it's six months, it's going to be composting in the residuals and it's going to be in the landfill. So uh, I haven't seen it yet. That's not to say there's no circumstance in which it's not better, but I, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend it at this point. Right. So there's, I agree with you wholeheartedly, George, and there's a couple of things we can do. You know, if we can get our contamination rates down in the composter, we won't have to screen as early. So we can allow it to continue through the full six months to, you know, get its full composting time. Um, Another thing, going back to waste reduction, though, you know, we have a lot of compostable plastics, but we also, because of the bylaws and such, have a lot of paper, you know, for food packaging, which have PFAS in them, right? So if we can move again away from single use towards reuse, and that's where kind of the reusable takeout program could come in, if we could try a pilot, you know, there's there's opportunities there. So again, remember, always going thinking back because um, there's always issues with re reuse. You know, we try to get away from plastics and we get into PFAS, right? Well, and that, if I could follow up, and that's my point is I think what I've heard from the, uh, from the, you know, the, the paper goods guys is that if you, mix and, and from a company that was doing the recycling is if you mix one with the other, if you mix the, you know, the biodegradable with the plastic, you've ruined that load of plastic and if you mix the other with the other you've ruined that load and so the question becomes a sorting issue and in some ways if we're not allowed to take plastic out of the waste stream one of the things you know because we can't take it out everywhere we may want to go back to straight plastic and then use paralysis or something else for those items rather than have you know this 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 weight this other waste stream and and and, and it's sort of there are trade-offs and every and i think you know, we think we're doing the right thing. And then all, you know, and then all the containers that are coming in, the plastic, can, there's, uh, we got rid of plastic bottles, which is great. And I agree with that, except that we replace them with uh, cardboard bottles that are worse. You know, they've got PFAS in them and they've got plastic in them and they don't break down. And then they're thrown in and, and they're, they're thrown in the waste stream. So in some ways, you know, we may, yeah, you know, we have that we we're trying to we maybe we have to whatever we do has to be uh, simple and it has to make sense within the uh, within the realities we're living in for the next 10 or 15 years. You know, I think, say, for, you know, and I spoke with Graham a couple of years ago. I spoke with my haulers. People can figure out how to separate food. It'll take a year or two for everybody to get their equipment and everything else. But I think if you had green buckets and you said all your food waste goes here. You know, that, that's something I think can be done as long as everything else stays relatively the same or gets easier. You know, so, so I think and that would, if that all could go on the drum, that's great. You know, that's something I think that we could, I mean, you'd have to sell it and it would take a lot of sales to people. But if we could point and say, this is what we're doing and 40 or 50% is gonna be, you know, beautiful compost and the other, you know, 30% is gonna be this and 20% is going off island. And, it's going to cost the sustain a little bit more, whatever it costs. I think then people will buy in. Are we ready for the next slide? Do you all, all have a well, well, I have one question, which is a little bit uh, uh, but, but, uh, off uh, in a slightly different direction, which is. Uh, this has all been very helpful, but there's this other facility that was wrapped into the waste services agreement, uh, which is not necessarily related to the other uh, parts of the MSW stream we've been talking about, which is the transfer station. And right now it's it's off to one side, it's 
you know, the hard to manage waste is separated on the access road and waste options is operating it and sending things to the mainland. Uh, one of the questions that came up uh, among staff is there are different views. Does the town want to own everything on its site? Or maybe this is this piece of the business, which is for handling C and D waste and certain difficult to manage waste. Maybe we handle that separately do what I call unbundle it and say, you know what, waste options can, or whoever owns that transfer station, maybe we break off a piece of land, lease it to them, don't have to argue about the price of buying the transfer station, let them do that business. And part of the site lease is all the permitted uses of the transfer station and all the responsibilities that come with handling the hard to manage waste. So that through the site lease, you have a separate business deal for that piece, that facility, that happens to be uh, solid waste, but not municipal solid waste, C and D and things like that. So I think it's kind of a threshold question. Does the town want to own everything on the site or does the town perhaps have a separate business deal for the uh, transfer station that doesn't involve ownership or, or spending uh, money on the town's behalf? And I don't even know if you have enough information to respond to that today but I just wanted to introduce it so that next time we we come up, we can talk about it at the next level. So any responses at this point? I think you said it there in the end, George. I feel like I would need to see some stuff on paper to understand. I haven't really thought through that idea. What I like about it is that we're, we're thinking creatively because that might be a viable option for us. Mm -hmm. But I, I think you have to really compare a lot of different pluses and minuses whether it's a cost benefit analysis and I haven't put any thought into that yet. I don't know about any other board members. I'm not even sure if I quite understood everything. <laughs> um, George and Graham, I think maybe for the next workshop, we pick yeah. up a couple of these things and really get into the detail of the pros and cons. Like for example, the transfer facility. What are the benefits of town ownership? What are the drawbacks? What would it cost? If we can even figure that out, maybe we can do a couple of scenario types of. Things. Yeah, but I also, I did want to go through this presentation without bringing up. So you've heard it once and the second time it will have percolated and then there'll be some context for. So yeah. because I, it, again, it's a decision that has to be made by November 30th, 2025. Yes, and, they, and keep reminding us about that, George. But also, this is something that even I have found, you, you really have to hear it over and over, some of it, to, to get it to sink in. Yep. Because it's just not stuff that comes into your normal, everyday town business thinking. And there's okay. no stupid questions. You know, even if you've already heard it a couple of times, like, please feel free to re-ask. It's a lot of information, and it's all over the place. So, you know, please no. feel free. Okay. Yeah, let's go on to recycling because that's important. Graham, you're going to do that the next slide. Sure. Yeah. And we have done some jumping ahead. So maybe some of these will go more quickly. Great. So we talked about diverting paper. There's a couple reasons for this. One can, if we have a much simpler compostable waste stream, um, as Matt B was talking to, like everybody knows what food is, right? Um, so is that something we can just put through the compost and we have a lot less contamination? Also the PFAS issue that we talked about. And then it would also align us with what the rest of the state is doing. Um, and the state has a lot of great resources that we currently aren't really able to access in terms of outreach and education just because we're so different. So if we were to align ourselves with the state for all these other great reasons, it has that um, extra boost, um, which, you know, helps us reach our communities better um, on Nantucket. Um, and, you know, we have some people come, coming from Boston or elsewhere in Massachusetts that would already be familiar. There's various MRF upgrades. So the materials recovery facility where all the recyclables come into. So when you go to the drop off and you put items into the down the chutes, that's the, it's going into the MRF building. Uh, this is the back side of the MRF building, all these uh, plastic bags. This is the drop off area for the haulers where they drop off the recyclables. And so um, we could definitely use some upgrades um, 
in the drop-off area is what we're seeing. Uh, we could use another catwalk where she can walk out and there's better flow uh, when people are going to drop off their waste. If you've ever been there on the weekends, it gets quite busy. Uh, and we're also looking into maybe what a bag breaker might look like. So we have this huge pile of bags here, you know, from the haulers. And as uh, Melissa mentioned, and you know, it's 75, 80% of each of the waste streams in the household waste um, comes from the haulers. So that's a big, significant pile. And those bags um, have to get torn open usually, um, and then the content sorted before it can, they can be processed. And actually right now with COVID and, and all of that, um, Waste Options hasn't been fully opening all of that because of safety concerns. So they've been going off island um, at more of a cost to the community to get recycled and sorted there. Uh, so we could use some major improvements in the sorting station if that's something you know we want to see and continue us continue here on Nantucket in the future. Maybe we ship off our all our recyclables without sorting them, um, or sorted however you know we have them. Or maybe we do the full sorting here, we bail them, and we ship them off, and we get more money. So that's kind of two different options we have, and along the way, between them, there's various technologies that we can. Uh, put to use there, uh, optic sorters and mechanical sorters and such like that that come at different costs. Uh, and then we talked about the colored bag program. So one of the challenges uh, that the haulers have expressed is that um, they use stake body trucks for uh, bringing in the residential waste to the drop off. And so stake body trucks are just big open, you've, they're the ones you see on the roads, typically big open um, back of the trucks, right? And they typically put all the MSW, the trash, the mixed trash, in towards the, where the cab of the truck is. And then in the back, they sort on one side the glass, and then the other side, they put the bags of plastic um, and tin aluminum. But as you can imagine, when you have a bunch of bags looking like that, like what we see in front of us, you know, it's hard to differentiate between what's actually, you know, a bag of trash and what's actually recyclables when you have a lot of bags and they might have toppled over each other. You've seen the trucks in the summer, they're picking up a lot of waste from people. So what if we had a colored bag system instead? Not only would it hopefully make the haulers, the driver's life, easier because then they see, oh, blue bag, that's a bag of plastic, a gray bag, you know, that's a bag of aluminum, um, that all needs to come out here. But it would also help hopefully um, with having sorted compostable waste, whether it's just food or whether it's still food and paper, you know, that's separate from this in a way. Um, but it would solve that issue. You know, we could even have green doors. So a green door is where, you know, the green bags go. And it would also help us, um, the operations side at Waste Options, if they see, you know, or if I'm out there and I see a bag that, a green bag in a blue pile, anyone can grab it really that's, you know, working there and put it in the correct pile and make sure it goes to the correct place to get sorted. So this is, you know, I have my hesitancies because, you know, we're introducing a lot more plastic um, in doing this. We could be, you know, with a drop-off community specifically in the recycling, but I think it achieves so many of the goals that we have been struggling to reach and the, the, there's a greater benefit. And maybe in the, in the long run, maybe we can figure some things better with the plastic aspect. But I think that's a short you know, setback compared to the gains that we could see. So if you all are interested in you know, seeing more about that and you know, I think we're looking at with your you know, guidance and your encouragement um, doing a pilot um, for a couple months, we would do a pre-pilot when checking um, contamination levels. And then in that specific community, whether it's Tom Never, Sconset, or you know, wherever else on the island, um, those were just the communities we were looking at before for various reasons, um, trying it out and seeing how it goes and measuring the, the dynamics there. We bring in a, a firm to do the work for us and, and quantify it all um, and see if it'd be worth expanding island-wide if it's successful, um, both you know getting the, the metrics we want and from the community engagement side of things too. I'll leave it there for right now and open it up to your ideas, questions, concerns. Graham, 
Um, it's just, I don't know if this helps the board or not, but when Graham and George first introduced this idea to me, I had some trouble understanding it and um, how it would help or be less complicated for the haulers. But they, one, when I looked at that photo, that, that really helped. So if you do have the colored bags, they, they don't really have to do much except chuck all the bags into the um, trash hauler vehicle. And then when it gets to the floor, there's not this guessing game of what is in each bag and figuring it out. It's red over here, gray over here, blue over here. And that just helped me visualize how potentially easier that could be. I, I was trying to think of a downside to it. And I couldn't really come up with one. Except maybe are there that many colors of bags to, available? Was I have them in my office, there are. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jason. I. I mean, I know, I'm sorry, Graham, I jumped the gun on it, but I absolutely love this idea. I think is exactly the kind of creative thinking we need to be able to partner with the haulers to help their customers um, be in compliance with our goals. Um, I think I, I've lived in a community where I had to buy special bags for trash. They cost a bit more than, you know, our clear white plastic bags, which cost more than the black plastic bags um, and people felt that pinch. Um, but I also, uh, and, and so I guess that would be one of my questions is do we know what you know, sort of the estimated cost of the different colored bags are and could we see, you know, what an project, what an average say family of four or six who might, um, you know, what their average trash trash would be like and, and what they would be spending on these bags in a month um if it comes out to being like 500 dollars a month then i think we have to you know reevaluate it but my sense is it's it's not that um so i i'm excited about this it feels like something that we can do um and i guess a, a sub a follow-up question would be have we talked with the haulers about this idea and would it you know have we had any feedback from them or were you starting with us first Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. So we have we haven't had any you know sit down conversations with the haulers, but it has been discussed um, various times, just brought up uh, casually. And I've spoken to various drivers, you know, when they pull in, especially with the waste works. I have that interaction um, and just throwing it out there as an idea because I I really want to hear from especially the people who are dealing with it day to day, you know, and we would certainly pilot it here at DPW too. And I definitely want to hear from the crew who's doing the same thing as, you know, as the haulers drivers too. So I want to hear from the people who are dealing with it day to day. Um, <laughs> and, and really, you know, what, what are their impacts? Is it, is it easier for them? But the drivers have certainly shared um, that they've, they think it's going to be easier. They're like, oh yeah, like then I can just grab the, the, the orange bag. That'd be so much easier. Um, because certainly with the waste sort, you do see a lot of perfectly washed, you know, com uh, perfectly washed recyclables and such that were about to go into the composter just because you know, the driver didn't see it back there at the back of the truck amongst all the other clear bags. Um, it's just not setting them up for success, the current system. Um, and the cost of the bags, I don't have it in front of me right now, but it's certainly much cheaper. And I would hope it would be also something that we could have at like the food pantry as well for people who need it in that way, thinking, you know, about how we can serve our entire community. It's not a big cost. Christine. I really like the idea of the colored bags. And I know that I think it was last summer, or the summer before downtown, we started doing colored trash tops. And I think if we match those bags, People are going to start to get the hang of it, even visitors, if they see my okay, black is compost in my house and it's also downtown in the black um, trash can. It's going to help with that kind of education of getting people on board. Yeah, I, I like the idea too, I, especially even if it was just two bags um, that, that had different colors, right? Because maybe that's why I would love talking to the haulers, right? Because they might say, we don't need bags for glass. It's so heavy. We always know what it is. Right. And so maybe it's just aluminum and plastic or 
I'm just making that up. Um, and really thinking through, you know, the colors of these bags. Um, I think it, I think it would be great. Okay. George. Yeah, just to say, you know, we have had some preliminary conversations with haulers who are at least, I use the word, open to and intrigued by it. I think it, in part because they understand there's pressure for separation and there are a lot of other alternatives they don't like as much, whereas this at least has some possibility. The concern is whether people will actually do it and do it right uh, and can we educate them well enough to make sure that it works the way it's supposed to. And that's part of what a pilot will teach us is how well do we actually do before you roll it out? Right, and that's uh, why the haulers have to love this idea because they will intrinsically be the enforcers, right? If they look at and the aluminum is not in the gray bag, they can't pick it up. That's gonna make the client mad, and but, but eventually people will, the, mm -hmm. they will comply because they want their stuff taken away. Yeah, on the mainland, they have what they call oops tags which is the little tag you put on the bag you leave behind that says, oops, this is, mis you know, this is in the wrong bag or, you know, it's kind of a thing in the industry, but other people do it and it's a learning curve. You have to see what works yeah. locally. But again, you, you got to pilot it first to find out the quirks that yep. uh, we're going to want. I should say that w the town did receive a proposal to roll out a pilot, uh, some specificity, there's some questions about procurement, how you do it, how you contract for it, what the budget is, but we just wanted to make sure that it's something that's worth the effort before we solve those ne that next level of problem. And similarly, uh, the MRF, uh, uh, I think uh, Melissa mentioned how excited everybody was when it opened in the 90s. Well, that makes it, you know, in the mid 20s in terms of age. And so it's time for some facelifts and, and upgrades so there, there, there are some things we know we need to do. There's some things we're not quite sure what needs to be done, but it's clear that something has to be done, but there are gonna to have to be some proposals on spending a little capital on the MRF to make it you know, a, uh, a better operating uh, facility for the town now that it's in its 20s and not brand new and spanking new anymore. So I just wanted to give that heads up as well. It'll be interesting to see what facility upgrades there will be what will it lead to? Is it just making it easier? I guess, what's the end product? Will, will it actually help the waste streams? Will it help with indirectly with the composter? I know I know they're two separate things, but just, I, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what upgrades, how it would affect the, everything. Yeah, so the answer to either or question is yes. Uh, and that, you know, some of it, literally there are holes in the roof that need to be fixed. Uh, some of it is looking again at the raised storing station and the foundation of it and the conveyor that goes in, maybe a bag breaker on the way in between the pile of bags and the inclined conveyor. And maybe there might be a need for another baler. We're trying to figure that out yet. Uh, so we're actually talking about what might be some significant investment and then how do you pay for that? So all that might be coming on the other hand. And so I just want to you know, gives a heads up before we get more specific on proposals. And then there will be decisions on cost, of course, as well, as we go down. But, uh, you know, before we dive into this, let's make sure you know about it and where, it's, where it might lead. Graham, do you have something on that? Uh, no, George, George covered it. Um, and I just want to make sure that um, it sounds like you all are supportive of the colored bag pilot. Um, and we should go ahead and start having some serious conversations with the haulers based on the proposal we had george touched on the procurement things that need to get figured out we're looking about you know give or take um but about fifty thousand um, dollars for a pilot and all bags will be provided to the you know the neighborhood that that is getting involved with that um so it wouldn't be you know an additional cost to the people who are taking part so if you are Yep. amenable to that we'll we'll continue going forth with that three board members said yes let's, so. but let's just remember we need to determine the funding too yep. Right. yep okay thank you okay uh so next slide eric are you still with us because we have Two more to get through before I wrap up. Okay, some of this topic we've uh, actually touched on, 
uh, which is in terms of managing that other MSW that wouldn't go into the compost. There's uh, some pictures of the tape taker to leave it, including you know some of the textiles are being uh, diverted. I didn't know that's an ongoing effort, and I'll leave the the uh, details to Graham in a bit. But I think that's one of the efforts for things that don't neatly fit into other categories might you know need need uh, more attention to be managed. Uh, I, the, the bullet salvage deconstruction is on here because uh, there's an enormous amount of construction and demolition debris going off the island. And uh, the question is, and right now it's getting sent to Youngstown, Ohio, and it costs a lot of money to get rid of. Uh, the, the question is, how much of that could actually be salvaged or reused or deconstructed uh, from everything uh, through you know, organized efforts to move construction materials or useful uh, bulky materials from one site to another through restores or other places. There are programs like this on the mainland to even requirements for deconstruction so that the wood is separated from the brick in certain ways. And you know, some, polar, some uh, demolition contractors do this very well. Others send mis mixed materials to the transfer station. Uh, there are a whole variety of proposals that I'm not going to go into now about how to do this. Everything from having a plan for deconstruction at the time of submittal for the building permit so that it's thought about in advance and the town can require it or even assess fees up front before the work is done uh, to various ways uh, or requirements for on site. But I just wanted to float the concept out there so that when we come back to it, uh, it won't be the first time you've heard the thought. So that being said, I think we did talk a little bit about uh, pyrolysis. At the bottom left is actually a, is actually a pyrolysis facility in a 40 foot uh, standard container. So you can go that small and this thing, you can make it electricity with another container. So uh, we're not talking about a huge facility or a refinery. We're talking about something that fits in a couple of containers and could actually be moved on or off. Uh, at one level of scale. So I just wanted people to have the benefit of having seen that picture, because sometimes when you say pyrolysis or gasification, people are thinking about, you know, Elizabeth, New Jersey scale refineries, and it's not necessarily the case. And we understand that anything that would be done on Nantucket would have to be appropriate for the scale of Nantucket, and there may be options out there that met the criteria. I mean, again, any new facility is going to attract attention, but if we keep it within the scale and, and it has a use, then I think we'll have a better chance to make it work and something can be done. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, Graham, did you want to jump in with anything else on the take it or leave it? Take it or leave it doesn't look like this anymore. If you check out <laughs> the town social media, Florencia made us a post today, um, letting everybody know it's drop off only, elite, uh, or sorry, it's take it only this week for shopping only, just because we've had such a surplus of items people have dropped off. But despite all that, the attendants are doing an amazing job sorting everything um, and keeping it nice and neat. So definitely check that out. There's some nice pictures there. Uh, we will need some more support with take it or leave it going forward, uh, more staffing. The two and a half positions is really awesome. But right now, um, if one of them sick or out for any reason, um, we'll have to close take it or leave it for the day because we can't open with just one person operationally. It's, it's just not feasible. There's no bathrooms over there for them to use. You know, there's a whole variety of challenges. So that is something we need to be working towards, getting three full-time staff as an absolute minimum. Um, and then some also, you know, more, more building space, um, indoor space really, um, and maybe some awnings and such uh, to, to get this um, to, a, to another stage uh, where we can really accept more items um, that people want to drop off and people want to take. We just can't currently facilitate that. We have to direct them to other means. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Okay. Questions, discussions? I think we have one slide and 15 minutes left, so maybe we're going to make it. Oh, let's go to the slide. All right, Matt. Mm -hmm. Just quick, uh, salvage deconstruction, I think that's a great thing to look into. I think uh, 
one of the issues we're going to have is who you know is going to be staffing and et cetera. It takes up a lot of space and a lot of uh, you know it could be really useful. It may it may help people make a decision. You know, depending what they're charged, they may make a decision not to you know to gut rehab buildings and throw a bunch of useful stuff out. So you know, I think I think it be it could be really helpful, but you know, the devil will be in the details, uh, you know. Yeah, thank you, Matt. We actually have a group of WPI students that are working with Holly Bacchuson and myself on this project and Lauren Sinatra is also um, stepping in sometimes to help with that. And there's been a lot of forward momentum. I personally, I mean, I, it's not up to me, obviously, but I personally don't see this as being something that, um, the town would really be great at doing. I think it would be a great public-private partnership um, of sorts. Again, you know, the devil's in the details, but I, I think that that's really what it, where it would be. Um, and there'd probably have to be some monetary, um, you know, you, there'd be probably some selling of, <laughs> of items at a, at a low price, like a thrift shop type setup. Um, but there's definitely been some excitement, even in cases that I wasn't expecting, mm -hmm. um, based on interviews WPI students have been doing um, the last couple of weeks. So that's really exciting. So stay tuned for their presentations. <laughs> Melissa? Thank you. I was just going to say what Matt said. I think this is a great idea. And I know there are other nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity who have looked into similar programs. And just like you said, Graham, this could be an awesome opportunity for some partnership um, and win-win. I don't know what some of their obstacles were to um, starting the program, but maybe if we talk, if WPI chatted with them, we could get some insight into that. If you were a I think we're good. Another, another slide. Okay, one last slide, which isn't solid waste management per se it's the Madiket site and i think it would be uh and i think you know matt fee has raised this on numerous occasions we have to pay attention to the site there are a lot of issues there and we would not be doing our job unless we spend at least a little time thinking about the site and how to manage its impacts and status so this is a picture this is actually taken out of a uh, report that the land council did uh on stormwater issues and and shared uh, with the town in 2019 and for various reasons uh, I don't know that there's been as much response to as there might have been given various distractions in the last two years but let's bring it back up and start looking at some of the issues again there's the picture of the site the the dark blue arrows show the flow of groundwater straight towards uh, Moong Pond uh, there are some you know I, I and uh, there are a lot of issues going on. You see phase one ABC labeled as inactive. And as I mentioned at the start of the program, the specific activity to close that site is on hold right now while their PFAS assessment is being performed. One of the uh, issues is you see something lab labeled soils and residuals. And those are materials that were taken out during the mining program, but they're stockpiled and it's not clear whether they have whether they can serve other functions or actually need to be included back inside the mound of the closure. Uh, if you look at the bottom right, there's a that compost pad area, and then below that, there's a stockpile of the old compost that probably, or is at least suspected, of having some level of PFAS that's higher than the compost that's being now that being produced now that the biosolids have been removed. What to do with that? And it might be that that material needs to be moved into the mound as part of the landfill closure. In fact, that's part of the basis for the DP allowing the closure to be deferred is to figure out what needs to be in and what needs to be out before the closure is required. Uh, if you look to the left, I think there are a couple other questions is that what can you do to the site to reduce impacts in what it is? And it turns out that there are a lot of things that can be done, and naturally, they all cost money. So if you look at the ponds, I mean, the Land Council had a suggestion to do an artificial wetlands there to, uh, to, 
to, to uh, treat the runoff. If you look at pond number two, there may be things you can do to pave the bottom, but you wouldn't want to do them until you knew what you had to do and associated with the closure of the landfill, which is right next to it. And when it rains, and if the rain runs off to that pond number two, you need a system that works. Below it is the compost pad. It's unpaved. If you paved it and collected the runoff, you could probably, uh, and, then, and then treated it or sent it to Surfside, you could probably uh, prevent a lot of that material from, from moving to the left and ending up in Long Pond. It's not obvious what the impact would be, but it might be significant. There's at least some reason to suspect that the runoff from the old compost pile is what's going towards Land Pond and, and, and constitutes a significant part of the nitrogen loading on Land Pond from the landfill. Uh, there are, and then there's the PFAS assessment, which is ongoing. So I don't know that this is necessarily a decision uh, uh, point for discussion, but I think it's an important that the site issues be highlighted and that you become aware of them uh, because my sense is that there is going to be a lot of capital expenditure, certainly with the landfill closure, but perhaps with some of the other measures. Uh, the land council did not identify costs, and one of the questions is: Is this something that the town ought to be doing going forward? I mean, in theory, you could pave two or two acres of the compost pad in fairly short order, and there would be improvements as a result. It might be hard to predict what those are. And on the other hand, uh, there's potential to spend an enormous amount of money without knowing what the improvements are. And so I just wanted to lay this issue out there. I think it's been sitting perhaps undiscussed, and maybe there are discussions I'm not aware of, but I just wanted to make sure it was on the list of items that got presented at this workshop because there needs to be discussion of it in some direction. So I think there may be lots of questions and frankly, I don't know how much I've clarified with it other than to raise it, which I think was the point, but I'm happy to take questions, comments on the whole question of what to do about the site other than perhaps start compiling options for uh, site improvement and then start to consider you know, how we might go about them and what they might cost. Jason? Yep, it's Matt. Yeah, I think uh, if there's any low hanging fruit in that report, I, I, I read it a long time ago. I think there may be a couple things in there that would be relatively easy to do. I think we should do it. Uh, when I look at the site, it's also in a storm tide pathway. The, uh, you know, at some point, you know, not in 10 years, five or 10 years, but in the 30, 50, 70 year time frame that is going to be, uh, you know, we, we are gonna be in the situation, we're gonna have a breach there and water flowing through. Um, you know, it, it, it's something we should be thinking about. It's not tomorrow. Uh, I look at that, I wonder whether we should be at high ground and that instead of spending 16 or 25 million, you know, here, maybe we should be, you know, maybe we should be treating the existing, you know, the future garbage, existing garbage, and as much out of the hill as possible. So in 30, 50, 70 years, we are uh, leaving that site in decent shape. You know, maybe the paralysis is out there and maybe the, you know, maybe we're composting there, uh, but the transfer of stuff and the other things are at high ground somewhere. I don't know. I just think we should be thinking about sort of the long-term uh, future and not just, you know, what's the easiest, shortest term thing right now. Uh, I don't want to be, we, should, we shouldn't have to hard armor the dump at some point, you know, that would be kind of crazy. So how do we, you know, how do we deal with it? So we don't have to do that, you know? And so, so, so if we could make a plan that, you know, it has some sort of time frames and, you know, some idea to move. And you know, the other thing I hear sometimes is, well, where would we go? Well, that question is going to be a lot harder in 20 or 30 years than it is right now. It'd be hard to find a place now, but near the airport, there's probably somewhere. And, you know, it's going to be a lot harder then when it's all fill, filled in with other uses. So it's a good time to be talking about it. And the other part I just wanted to mention before I forget 
we talk about the transfer station, do we run it? You know, has abandoning it become a, a you know, if it's operating elsewhere on the island, maybe it's something that we don't have to run and maybe we don't have to license it to someone to do anything else. Maybe the private sector will take care of it. They're already doing some of it. So a couple of people are already doing some of it. So maybe there's things that we don't have to do as a town. So that's what I have. Thanks. Okay. George, do you want to speak to my name? I will say if we want everything to go private in terms of what's hand, hand, handled at the transfer station, that means things are going to have to get charged for. I'm just putting it out there. You know, the, those hard to manage waste items that currently go through the transfer station, they would, you know, mm -hmm. that would, you know, for a uh, private entity to deal with it, they'd have to charge. But George, I know you've got some answers for about the mining too, I think, right? Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, I think Matt's uh, characterization was very was very strong that this is not an easy issue and it's a long term consideration. I mean, just responding to one thing, I think you actually made a pretty good argument not to buy the transfer station because if if you lease it, then you can have a lease of a certain term with termination provisions, and when the time comes, you know you you move on to whatever is next without necessarily having spent town money buying a site that isn't forever. Uh, I think that the, the whole landfill closure issue is going to be difficult when it comes. Uh, it's not cl clear when exactly that's going to happen and what the PFAS assessments will show and what's going to be needed to do, but that's going to end up involving a lot of mass DEP interaction as to what they uh, want to happen etc i mean one of the questions is right now the landfill closure plan has the mound topping out at 70 feet uh can the town go higher or move part move things around on the on the site and change the profile uh it's not something the town's considered previously but it might be something that in order to move out of certain low layer areas that's what you might need to do uh would the town pay to move material that uh can't stay there to go to the mainland. I think uh, we had this, uh, I think after the last select board meeting, Matt, uh, in part uh, based on some of, the th some of the comments you made there, we were asking, well, okay, well, I don't know if we can solve the whole problem. What can we start, what piece of the problem can we start attacking now? And one of the questions as well, that 20,000 uh, cubic yards of compost of questionable composition, can we move that to the mainland? Well, at 20,000 at 250 bucks and some starts being $5 million. Uh, and then if you look at, at also very large here, uh, and you know, is there some way to pick off a piece of it and spend half a million dollars and get started with the worst piece? Maybe there is some, I think certainly in some of the stormwater things, there may be some issues that you can do for small doubts, but we're talking a lot of money over a lot of time and big scale. So I think that's why, again, it's gonna take some work and thought and understanding. And uh, there's no time like the present to get the conversation started, even if we're not gonna be able to finish the work today, because next time, having seen the issue once, there may be thoughts and you know more direction and more specifics, and we'll have some time to develop more specifics as well. So that's probably an unsatisfactory answer, but I think the, a piece of it is sometimes you just got to start a hard conversation, even if you can't conclude it at the same meeting. Uh, go, go ahead, Matt. I, I forgot to ask the public if they had any questions. So just quick question. Is, is there a way, way to treat uh, compost for PFAS? Is there anything that can be added to a compost or added to the process that would uh, you know would would treat would pull that out or is it too late once it's at that stage? Uh, it's an interesting question. I'm not going to say no. Uh, most PFAS treatments I've seen are either aimed at destruction of PFAS in liquid or so or gaseous streams and not solids. In fact, most of them are aimed at gas and only a little bit at liquids. But there are other areas where there's contain what I would call dirty dirt where you can make additives or mixing or do things that actually solidify and stabilize it. So is there a stabilize in place technology that would work for that particular theory? I don't know the answer to that. It's worth asking the question and see if we come up with something. 
Any other questions from the board or anyone else? I know there's some uh, Capcom members here. Questions or comments? Even if we can't get to it today, at least we can get it out there and get back to you. Steven, Richard. Rick, Janet. Members? Melissa? Yeah, sorry. I'm good. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Jason. Anybody? Well, I, I found this really, really helpful. I, I really did. And I, the time flew by in, in, a, in a good way. Well, thank you. Really, I, um, there's, it is complex, but I think we, we found at least areas where we need a little more information for our next workshop. And so we can give you, give you more direction that's not helpful. Janet, do you have anything? No, I don't. I'm just monitoring for, for the purposes of making, keeping track of this strategic planning process. Okay, thank you. Melissa? Thanks, Jason. I guess one thought that I have is, and maybe this is a way to help us make some decisions, is, you know, starting from the end, of you know 2025 and going backwards when do we just need to just make decisions on what you know sort of by by when so that as we go through this process we can start to check off like okay well we answered that in november of 2023 or <laughs> you know that 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 would be helpful to me in sort of prioritizing okay. what we have to get answers to and by when okay Thanks, Melissa. Richard, do you have anything? Uh, no, not at this time. I, I, I'm going to be curious to see how many potential bidders we'll have in 2025 to manage the, the process, but that's for another time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, Libby, George, Graham. Sorry, I kind of cut us off, but it was at six. I'm going to be Careful everyone's time. I, I think we have a pretty good handle on the additional information needed and some of the questions that were asked and will be um, prepared for your next workshop, which Graham, when is that again? Monday, February 7th? Yeah. Is what we're shooting for. So everybody might want to mark that down in your calendar. We'll try to get a um, an outlook out to save the date kind of a thing. And uh, I guess in the meantime, if you all have any additional thoughts, just let us know. Otherwise, we'll keep plugging away. Okay. Which board member, is there a group, working group right now where a board member's on? Are they meeting? It's a staff group right now. Okay. We've done, Christy was on for a little bit and we've had other board members from time to time. It's hard to, it's hard to um, establish a meeting that we can consistently stick with. Mm -hmm. So we sort of dropped the, um, the board member in lieu of having workshop sessions that, where everybody could contribute. That makes sense. Okay. George? I just want to say that from our perspective, this has been enormously helpful in terms of the questions that have been asked and even some of the high level guidance uh, that you've given. We understand that getting all this thrown at the board in a short time, some of it for the first time, that we're not going to solve it all in the first time. But if you don't start the conversation, you can't make any progress on it. And as uh, staff, we need guidance uh, to get a sense of that if we're going in the right directions or if we need to change directions. So I just want to thank everyone for their very helpful questions, comments. I hope we've been uh, helpful in, in bringing the material forward. If you have any questions, of course, uh, we're all here to support the process in any way that uh, we can, and hopefully we can make it lead to good decisions. Thank you, George. I think this was helpful versus doing a 30 minutes on a Wednesday night when we've got 20 other items, agenda items, I know this is long for hours for everybody at the end of the day, but it helped. Sam, do you have anything? Um, I just wanted to thank you. It, it, as George said, it, this has been very helpful. I feel like we don't know how to respond, but having, you know, just giving, a, letting us know we're going in the right direction and we should continue putting time and effort there is, is really beneficial because there's a lot of things pulling us all in all directions. So thank you for that. Um, and I also want to put it out there. Sometimes it helps to just 
see it. I know we're talking about the future, but seeing what's currently existing, and I'd be happy to give you all tours of the landfill um, if, if you want to come out. Just reach out to me and make that happen. Right, thank you. Anything else, everybody? Good to go. Do you need motion to adjourn, Jason? I think I do. Uh, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Melissa Murphy? Aye. Matt Fee? Aye. Jason Bridges, aye. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>